Welcome back to welcome back to a new YouTube live as usual at the same time every Sunday. You know that last week was a little bit special. So instead of being live here, we were on Zoom. I know that some of you who are here now were there back now, were there back then, and it was super cool party. We now have the recording which is up on this channel. So if you haven't watched it yet, you can watch it now. I'm also adding a lot of new things to this channel. Um, as you might have seen, there is now a podcast, which I recall with guests, which is called Cultural Fluency. There are two episodes of that on this channel. And the third one was recorded two days ago, and it will be released next Wednesday. So there will be more of that coming your way. Uh, if you have enjoyed the podcast before, well, there is a lot more coming. And I am also making more videos uh, where I react to uh, famous people who are speaking French. I react to them in the exact same way that I react to my one-on-one -on -one client and also to the members of the French Accelerator in our group coaching. So I know that some of you were in the group coaching. We had the group coaching exactly two hours ago. It's going to be at the same time every Sunday. You can still join the French Fluency Accelerator. I believe the link is in the description. So if you want to join, you can join. I would love to have you there. And that is an opportunity to have a two-way conversation, not just me talking and you uh, interacting in the chat. Um, and so I'm making those videos uh, currently about Bradley Cooper because there are a lot of interviews uh, with him speaking French. And that's a great opportunity to teach a bit of grammar and a bit, a bit of uh, vocabulary. Um, with a uh, with a video on YouTube. So there's more coming your way. They have been recorded. I am currently editing them. Uh, the second one will be released, I believe, tomorrow. I'm, I'm almost done with it. Um, and so that's a long introduction for housekeeping uh, without even mentioning the topic for today. The topic for today is la laïcité. If you've never heard of that, well, you were about to. So as usual, there is a worksheet which you can still find on my Telegram channel, even if you're watching the replay right now. It's not really a worksheet. It's more like a fact sheet. Everything like, which you can see, which is underlined here, is actually a link. And all of those links are to pages, web pages. Those pages are in French. Uh, but I think you can still read them, uh, most of you. And you know, worst case scenario, we can translate them. But those are the links that you can use to dig deeper into the topic that we are going to uh, speak about today. And um, yeah, I also have this print for later. Um, yes. So how are you guys? I see there's a lot of like things going on in the chat. I haven't even said hello to anyone. So we have Connie here. We have both Lindas, uh, Linda Unger and Linda Garmi. Sweet to see you again, Linda. Uh, Gami, uh, I remember seeing you last time. We have Marilyn, thank you for being here after sitting through the live coaching uh, two hours ago. We have Omo which we haven't seen in a while. Thank you for being back here. And um, yeah, Do you, have you ever heard of la laïcité? Like, does this, ring, this, does this word ring a bell? If you were to translate it in English, it would be secularism. And specifically, we're going to speak about state secularism in France because it's, a, it's an important value of the French, but they don't really seem to understand what it's about. And the reason why I picked this topic is because this very week, and it feels crazy to me to think that it was just on Wednesday that it happened because I have been working so much, I'm getting the impression that it was ages ago, but no, it was on Wednesday. Uh, the Ministère de l'Education, so the uh, Education ministry, the education uh, office, I guess, you know, the, the body of the French government, which deals with education, has released a new ad campaign, which you can see on the worksheet here. I, I know it's really small. I haven't been able to find better pictures of those online, uh, which is kind of weird, but they had eight posters where they're trying to promote la laïcité and what it is. But unfortunately uh, for them, there was a lot of outcry on social media, uh, especially of people complaining that this thing which is portrayed here has nothing to do with laïcité as a concept and is just even potentially uh, racist, like, you know, let's say it like it is, uh, because of the, the way it is portrayed. So if you have, if you just saw this, if you saw this, like I know I shared it on Instagram. Uh, if you've seen this and you've never heard of that before, it can be a little confusing because it's really like full blown French culture, which you, you need to know a little bit of background or a lot of background to understand what that is about and what people are even, why the government would try to promote this thing, laïcité, which we still don't really know what that is, and why people on social media, especially people on the left, uh, you know, political left, uh, complained a lot about that campaign and just generally the way it's done. And yeah, so 
If you're, if you're ready, we're going to go for some context so that you can understand the, this idea of laicity and why the French are bringing it up every time. They, it really, the French love to bring up the laicity in unrelated situations or like not unrelated, but yeah, they just bring it up a lot. Sometimes it's completely unrelated. So I started right off with a definition because I like to speak about, uh, to know what we're speaking about. So there are two definitions of the word laicité and we're speaking mostly about the second one today, but the first one is important. So the first definition in French is la laicité is le caractère laïque. So the uh, secularism is the uh, virtue or the feature of something which is secular. So the word like will mean actually two different things depending on who is using it. So it is a word that is used by priests, by people who are members of the church. Uh, and so not just church goers, but priests, like the people whose job it is to be in the church. Those people will use the word like to refer to the people who are not members of the church. So from the point of view of a priest in France, I would be unlike. Okay, so like basically means what does not have uh, anything to do with the church or what is not affiliated to the church. And in France, specifically, we have this thing, which is uh, the second uh, definition here, principe de séparation de la société civile et de la société religieuse. So this I borrowed from a dictionary, Le Robert. So it's the principle of separating civil society, so the society of, you know, the state, uh, it's mostly the state, to be honest, and religious society. So the idea behind laïcité, and it's really just that, is that the state and religion are completely separate. The state has no official religion and religion is a private matter. And this is really super important to understand as a, as a baseline concept. The whole point of laicity is that religion is a private matter and that we, like the state has no business dealing with what religion I go to. Like if I want to go to a church, I mean, I'm not living in France, so that's a bit of a different situation, but let's assume that uh, I'm speaking about people who are living in France right now. So if I was living in France, uh, if I want to be a member of a church, uh, I can do it. And it's no business of the French state. So they are not even actually allowed to ask me uh, if I'm part of the church, which is very different from many other countries and in particular Germany and Austria, which I live in Austria now, I lived in Germany before. They, there actually are this, there is this document, which is like registration formula, which every time you, if you move to a new address or if you come to the country for the first time, you will have to give a lot of information about you. And one of them is which religion you're a part on. So you can always pretend that you don't have a religion, but if you do have one and it's important to you, you will have to tell them, uh, just, you know, and then they will make you pay taxes for it. So especially if you're a Christian and I don't know, I think the Jews and the Muslims also have to pay taxes to their own respective church. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. Some states will expect you to give them information about your religion and they will not be separated from uh, the state. So for example, here in Austria, there's an official state religion. The Austrian state is officially Catholic. That does not mean that everyone in the country is a Catholic. You have a right to choose your religion because you have religious freedom. It's different from being a like secular state. So in France, not only you have religious freedom, but the state has no business dealing with religion in theory, okay? So that means that each time, because the thing is that in practice, people who work in the government very often has a, have a religion and it's important to them, but they're supposed to keep it separate from their job. It's very hard to do that. I mean, if you're very convinced in a particular mind frame, it's very difficult to not also bring that mind frame into your job. So that's one thing. And another thing is that you're supposed to not be discriminated on the basis of your religion, thanks to state secularism. But as you probably can guess, uh, it's not always the case. Uh, Jews, for example, face a lot of discrimination in France, not officially, and there actually isn't no statistic about uh, religion uh, or about discrimination uh, in France. There are statistics about hate crimes, but that's it. Uh, we also cannot list the ethnicity of a person. So you, are, you don't have any document that mentions your ethnicity, it's illegal. And that leads to actually mostly being unable to uh, visualize or to understand the phenomenon of discrimination or just generally how people's religion interact with their life because we have no data. But it is on purpose, it is because we consider that your religion and, and as an extension of that, your ethnicity and your, or your personal origins are a private matter 
and that the state only sees you as a citizen. So that's really, I know that's a lot of like rumble to explain, but I hope that makes sense uh, because it's really like the core concept. And then I can move into the uh, history and how we got there. Let me read through a couple of comments. So uh, Linda is saying, it would be nice if it was like that here. So here is in the US, I believe it's supposed to be, but it's not. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the situation is uh, in the US. Linda Gami is saying, yes, does have the same concept. Also, as Linda said, it's complicated now. To be honest, I will admit that it is also extremely complicated in France, and that is why we are going to take an hour today to speak about it. Uh, I'll try to take a bit less than an hour so I can give you a, a little French summary and we can speak about the idioms of the week and also answer a couple of questions. Bonjour, Cynthia. Nice to see you here. Uh, many French people also... Yes, so that's this thing about the law of laïcité. The French are utterly sure that they are the only country in the world which has it. It's quite fascinating because actually, no, uh, the France is not the only country that has it. And for example, the countries that has it as well, uh, you know, besides the US, I actually didn't know that it was a thing in the US, but that makes sense because the federal state does not have so much to do with uh, the actual life of people because it's a federal country, so that makes sense. Although, I mean, here in Austria, it's also a federal country, but we don't have this uh, particular feature. But a country which at least used to have it, I'm not sure if it's still the case because they have elected quite an extremist president, is um, Turkey. And when I was, that was back when I was still living in France and I was still uh, dealing with my parents on the regular, I did have a class where I had two Turkish students to whom I was speaking French. No, speaking, well, speaking and also teaching French. And they explained to me that their country also has secularism because I was supposed, like, it, when you're the teacher of French to foreigners who live in France, you do a lot of teaching about French values and, you know, French concepts. Sometimes it's weird. I mean, let's admit it, like, this concept of secularism is freaking weird. The concept of universalism, which is another French value, is freaking weird. It's the idea that we are all equal and we don't really see the difference. And in practice, we do have differences. So it's, it's a really weird thing to conceptualize. So I spent a lot of time explaining that to people. People and those two students were like, yeah, but uh, in Turkey, it's actually the same. I was like, oh, I was surprised. So I Googled it and I found out that it is correct. It is the same in Turkey. And then I told my father that it is the same in Turkey. And my father was like, no, no way. It's not possible. Like Turkey is a Muslim country. They cannot possibly be secular. And, and that's the thing with my father is that if he's wrong, he's going to keep being wrong. So that's, that's that. Like, don't think that every French person is like that. But there is definitely a tendency of thinking that this feature is only ours and it's a so-called exception française. That's the thing I've uh, read about on social media this week again. L'exception française de la laïcité. It's like it's just us. No, it's not just us. Plenty of countries have it as well. But it's particularly important and particularly discussed in France. And often if you tell the French that no, it's not just us, they're like, no, no way. Like the other countries can't possibly have us. Like we are so special. They're not. Uh, but it is true that they do have quite the history uh, to back up the uh, the situation with la laïcité. And so I put a couple of uh, links and, and details here on the worksheet. So the first element, uh, so la laïcité became a official thing in 1905, which is the second day that you have here. It says loi de séparation des églises et de l'État. So on that time, there was an official law that was passed which said, okay, church and state are separate. They have nothing to do with each other. And there are a couple of reasons why uh, this law became, uh, became uh, a law, basically, why this law wasn't made. But one of the main elements, uh, Omoleo is saying my country is the same. Can you tell me which country that is? That would be cool. I, I don't think I know where you're from. Um, so the, the key, the main historical element uh, that led to really like the moment when <laughs> shit is the fan and the French realized they had to do something to not let religion mix up with the state was the so-called Affaire Dreyfus. So I have linked in the worksheet a great TED, TED talk that uses the story of Dreyfus to illustrate why you think you're right even if you're wrong. And I really recommend watching this TED talk. It's in English. I was very surprised to uh, watch it and find out that the person has used the Affaire Dreyfus to, uh, to illustrate this, but it's what they did. And the federal government has nothing to do with what is considered private. Yeah, so it's the same as in France. Tell me which country it is. I'm, I'm so curious. 
So the thing that happened to Dreyfus is that uh, Dreyfus was a member of the army. And in that army, there was a spy. So there was some spying going on. It was pretty clear that the enemies, um, namely, uh, I believe the Germans, were receiving information that they shouldn't be receiving. And they could only get it if someone in that army was a spy. That was straightforward. But then people thought that they had found the spy when they suddenly accused Mr. Dreyfus, Alfred Dreyfus, Alfred was his first name, of being the spy. And the thing is, they really had no proof whatsoever uh, other than finding like a letter where they thought that the handwriting was looked kind of like Dreyfus's handwriting, kind of, not really, but yeah. Uh, but the main thing about Dreyfus, which was important, is that he was Jewish. And the whole story of Affair Dreyfus is pretty ridiculous looking at it from now. Uh, I, I, I mean, from my point of view, at least, I'm hoping that other people find it ridiculous as well. But the whole idea is basically like, because Dreyfus is Jewish, he has to be guilty. And then they say, OMG, I learned this in my world history class in 12th grade and totally forgot about it till now. Cool. Well, uh, refresher. Oh, Nigeria. Cool. I didn't know that Nigeria was also a secular country. That's pretty cool. So, yep, Dreyfus was uh, necessarily guilty because he was Jewish and there was no way of uh, imagining that he could be not guilty. So, basically, they condemned him and they sent him to some prison in the Caribbean when back then it wasn't as cool as it is now, let me tell you. And it took a good, I mean, I think 15 years for the French state to eventually admit that they had made a mistake. And that included the spying continuing after Dreyfus was already removed from the army and even finding someone whose handwriting matched the previous letter, the letter that was attributed to Dreyfus, the handwriting of that person matched the letter much more closely. So it was very clear that that person was the spy because the spying continued and, and there was a lot more proof against him, but he was Christian and he can't possibly be guilty because he's a, he's a Christian. And so that's because of, or like, uh, after at least this story that the French realized, oh shit, we have to do something to avoid people being considered guilty on the basis of their religion. Because it's ridiculous. For one thing, it's horrible for Dreyfus himself. I mean, as a person, like, of course, it broke his life completely. Uh, he, he, he eventually returned to the army, but like 15 years later, like, what the hell? And second, it's horrible for the state because you realize that after you have kicked the Jew out of the army, the spying continues and you're still having left with the problem. And they, they, they realize at that point, OK, like we have to like set aside our anti-Semitism and do something so that anti-Semitism or hatred for any religion in particular would be set aside once and for all. And that is when they introduced the law, 1905, that is separating the state and the church. It's also a law that uh, states that, that, well, that makes it so that the church, the state officially cannot sponsor a religion. Now, I did find out that some religions, some churches are actually being sponsored by the state because they have managed to uh, present themselves as cultural associations. So the state is allowed to sponsor culture. So that works. But officially, if you're a church, if you're an official church, you cannot receive donations from the state, uh, which is why there are, can be a number of problems for like repairing churches and so on, because uh, it's complicated. But officially in France, if you're a church, you cannot receive a donation from the state, except in one part of France, which is Alsace and Lorraine. Because in Alsace and Lorraine, back in 1905, this part of France was not a part of France. It was a part of Germany at the time. And it was reconnected to France after World War II. And because they weren't a part of France at the time, all of the laws that were passed at that time actually don't apply to them. So they have a special regime where the, uh, the priests can actually be civil servants, similar to how it is in Germany, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. They just have like their own special situation. Um, there was one of our moment in history where this law was suspended, and that was during the so-called regime de Vichy, which is 19, between 1940 and 1944. If you know your history, you know that this corresponds roughly to World War II, you know, minus a couple of months at the beginning when the French hadn't been completely laminated out of the way by the Germans, and a couple of months at the end when the uh, American had already, did, had already landed in France and the Germans hadn't capitulated yet. But roughly, that's the time of World War II. Of course, because World War II was mostly started because of anti-Semitism, 
So, I mean, I, among other factors, but anti-Semitism was a big part of that. And so, of course, uh, when the Fran France de facto became a part of Germany, that law was out of the table. But after France regained its independence, it became part of the, uh, the values of France again. So that's basically the origin story of laïcité and where it came from. So originally, uh, Lina is saying, I think Dreyfus was Alsacian too. Um, that's possible. I think he was from there, but he was in Paris or something. And maybe that was part of the reason why he was uh, attacked, why he was accused, you know, being Jewish and also Alsatian. I guess that, that adds up. But anyway, he was not guilty. I mean, it's very clear that he was not guilty. Like we are, we are 100% sure right now. So this part, like, I mean, it's a lot of history, uh, but it's important to understand that originally laicity had nothing to do with Islam because we had hardly any Muslims in France at that time. We actually only started to have Muslims in France, or like, you know, in vast numbers to the point that now Islam is the second largest religion in France. So there are a lot less, a lot more Muslims than Jews as of right now. Uh, they actually became an important demographic after the war when we had a lot of immigration from mostly North Africa, which are now Muslim countries, because of the rebuilding of the country. Um, but then, as you can see, the dates, uh, they have a really good jump. So there's nothing mentioned between 1944 and 2015. I could have probably found other stuff, to be honest, but I wanted to keep it tight because uh, we don't have three hours to discuss laicity. So the next thing, which uh, is important, unfortunately, like it's really sad elements of recent history um, that are important to understand why the laïcité now is just becoming such a big um, uh, tug of war, bone of contention, you say that. I don't know how to say that. It's just, it's a, it's a big thing that people fight over. So on the 7th of January in 2015, there was what is, has now been known as the Attentat contre Charlie Hebdo, so please tell me if you've heard of that. Uh, it was, I mean, you must probably have heard of that, but it was a while ago. Um, and um, it's like the French 9-11, to be honest. Like everybody remembers when, what they were doing on the, nine, uh, on the, the 11th of September, 2001. I remember, even though I was 16. Um, and I think every French person remembers what they were doing on that day. Yes, it was in the news here. So yeah, and I... I I arrived at work at like nine, I think it was a uh, Friday. So I was at work late because we had a smaller day on Friday, a shorter day. And I had a French colleague who was working in the same office at that time. And she told me, first thing she told me was, t'as vu Charlie Hebdo? So did you see Charlie Hebdo? And the first thing I did when she said Charlie Hebdo is I laughed because I was like, <laughs> and no, what did they do? Because Charlie Hebdo is known for uh, their caricature, mostly known for the drawings that they make. And the drawings are, funny and offensive at the same time. So I pondered the possibility of putting some of those drawings on the worksheet. I decided not to do it. If you Google Charlie Hebdo caricature, you will see the kind of things uh, that they have made. It's practically a national sport for that newspaper to be, uh, to get, to, to be getting sued by religious organizations because they do a lot of caricature of religious figures, mostly the Pope, uh, most of the caricatures they've made are against Christianity. It's a very big thing in France to be against Christianity and against religion in general, to be honest. Like it's just, yeah, it's kind of national sport, to be honest. Like there, there was a big sentiment against religion, which has led to creating this law in the first place. And we still, it still is a very beloved activity to just dislike religion. Like my parents, for example, completely dislike religion. And when I was a child, there was a narrative growing on that I wasn't being baptized and I wasn't receiving a religion so that I can choose when I'm older. Um, but then when I started having an interest in religion and spirituality as a teenager, I got a lot of backlash for that from my parents because it's uh, if you're a decent human, uh, you cannot possibly have an interest in religion, which of course is a lot of crap. I'm sure you know that because you're not French. Um, but if you're French, you might believe the opposite. So that's that. So Charlie Hebdo, very, very violent and very um, um, corrosive and, and insulting for religions, getting sued left and right by every single religious organization in France. But unfortunately, on the 7th of January 2015, and you know where I'm coming from because you've heard of it, uh, they had a little bit of a bigger problem than a lawsuit because a, terror, a terrorist or two, 
I don't remember. I think it was two guys. And they came into the, uh, into the office of Charlie Hebdo and just decided to start shooting everyone. And most of the people who were uh, making, like, I think all of the cartoonists but one were killed because they were specifically the ones that were targeted. And the reason why they were targeted was uh, because they had made a caricature of the prophet Muhammad and, and God. And as you might know, in Islam, it is forbidden to draw God or draw the prophet Muhammad. And, oh yes, the two brothers, Koulibaly or a name like that. And that is, that is the, uh, the reason that was the, the cause that prompted the assassination or the, uh, the attacks against Charlie Hebdo uh, to happen. A number of people died that had nothing to do with it uh, also in the attacks, but I guess collateral damage or whatever. And following on this, there was a lot of outcry in France because we cannot imagine, first off, we don't respect religion at all. And we cannot possibly imagine that you would want to kill someone for drawing. It's just, it's a really, really big disconnect because between the general French mindset, which is very disrespectful of, of religion and think that making a drawing is just, you know, freedom of speech. And the mindset of some of the French Muslims who do consider that, no, you cannot draw God or uh, the prophet. And most of those people would not have done anything violent against the cartoonists, of course. I mean, they are, like the vast majority of those people are not terrorists and would, they would even uh, openly condemn the attacks, but they still would think that it was not correct to, to do something that's forbidden by religion. But secularism says that actually, since the state has no business, like since religion is a private matter and those people were not Muslim themselves, they were basically legally allowed to do it. And most French people would say that, yeah, like the, the civilized way to deal with it is to sue them, which is, you know, they have lawsuits left and right. So I agree, obviously. Um, I just wanted to like, you know, to put that here so that you understand what, what happened and how it became really like a big, big, uh, very heated topic because of course these people absolutely did not deserve to die like no way and like no one deserves to die for starters but like you can see how we have a climate where Islamophobia is becoming a big thing like it's becoming very like Islamophobia is now practically not replacing anti-semitism because unfortunately anti-semitism is still there uh, it's still there and still pretty bad like not denying that but there's a big amount of Islamophobia as well and when you have these kind of things happening it creates a lot of tension. And that is also the kind of thing that causes the French to sometimes misunderstand what secularism is. Because secularism has nothing to do with, with race, for example, and even very little to do with what people do, like actually nothing at all uh, to do with what people do. Uh, it's just the, the fact that the state has no business dealing with religion and that religion is a private matter. Um, but often that, that leads to things like rules that you cannot, like there is a rule in French schools which is very strict that you cannot have a very clear religious sign. And they do consider that a headscarf, which Muslim women wear, is a religious, a religious sign, sign. And to be honest, it's not actually a religious sign because there are lots of Muslim women who don't wear it and they're still Muslim. It's more of a cultural sign. And it's just a piece of clothing and you wish they would let women wear what they want, but it's just not how it is. Some schools try to twist it differently to like make it a bit more, I don't know, palatable. So for example, when I was in middle school, we were not allowed to wear something on our head inside of the building. So no cap, no nothing on top of the head. That was just the rule. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's what they do. See, it's just, yeah, we do tend to consider that school is a, has to be a neutral space. And if you bring your religious sign in school, then you're already trying to convert people. I think it's ridiculous. It's, it's interesting because after I have lived 10 years abroad and I've seen how it works in other countries and have been, for example, to school here like as a teacher uh, in Austria, which is a Catholic country where the Muslim students are perfectly allowed to wear their headscarves and they cause no problem at all. I'm like, okay, yeah, um, maybe we can just let them have their clothing. Uh, Cause it's just, if it's not a problem here, it shouldn't be a problem there. But according to the French, it is a problem. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where we're at. And then the last fact that I'm adding to this list is the assassination of Samuel Paty. And the whole talking about school serves as a good segue for that because Samuel Paty was a history teacher. Uh, that was last year. I mean, that was, uh, it's actually coming, it's going to be a year 
in a month. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, Samuel Paty was a history teacher and he decided to teach a lesson about the Charlie Hebdo caricature, caricatures. And it's difficult to find out exactly what happened because it seems that the whole story was based on the fact that one student who was not in class with him, like who was not in that class, said to other people that he had been disrespectful toward Islam, which he was not. But anyway, next thing you know, someone unrelated to the school decided to kill Samuel Paty by beheading him. It's just like, um, I mean, the word is égorgé uh, by slitting his throat. So it's very, it's very graphic when you know the, the whole idea. And then that person, the, the murderer, tweeted at Emmanuel Macron uh, to, to brag about the crime. And then it followed that there was a massive outcry. So there already was a massive outcry after the uh, attack against Charlie Hebdo. And then there was again a massive outcry uh, against, uh, against this particular attack. And because the French are already kind of Islamophobic and some of them just cannot make a difference, it, it becomes very heated again. And I'm honestly very afraid that it will keep getting worse. Uh, there was another attack like two or three months after that uh, against the church and it's just, I felt that Emmanuel Macron was really not handling it well. And yeah, situations that we have now where people are very heated, don't really understand what's going on. There's a lot of hate going on and there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of hate and a lot of people just not understanding what all of that is about because laicity, the whole thing, would theoretically have nothing to do with terrorism and would just be the fact that the state is separate from the church. Most history teachers, as far as I know, do teach with those caricatures to, to explain to the students uh, what happened and how religious intolerance works and things like that. Because in France, that's just how it is. We teach these kind of things. So it could have potentially happened to any history teacher, which is scary. And so in the middle of all of this uh, now, we have this new campaign because the school year is starting as students are going back to school, I mean, at least some of them were the, the, in metropolitan France, in the European part of France, uh, students are going back to school. In some of the overseas departments, the, it's been delayed because of COVID, but you know, most, most French students are going back to school. And this is why we are having this, which we're going to discuss after I take a couple of comments. So Tony, oh, hi, Tony. Um, Dreyfus was born on the 9th of October, 59 in Mulhouse. Oh, in the French Empire, because back then it was under Napoleon III, close to the Swiss and German borders. Right, so Mulhouse is in Alsace, this is correct. Linda, no idea where I put that from my brain, but I'm sure brain cells are responsible for this title. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. As the opposite in Nigeria, people are, are very religious. Yeah, I mean, there, you can have a very religious country and also have state secularism. It's, it's possible. For example, I went to Azerbaijan. And they have state secularism there, but the pe most people are religious. They have a few religion, like Islam, I think, is a majority religion. And they have another couple religion, including like the fire religion, which is local from there. And I know it's kind of cool. And countries, it can work. I think it's only the French, to be honest, who are having such a hard time with it. Like, I think the so-called exception française is not the fact that we have state secularism, because a lot of countries do have it. It's the fact that we struggle with it like so bad. And because we struggle with it so bad, our beloved um, state secretary, minister, I don't, I never know how to say minister in English because minister tends to be a religious term. Um, but like, you know, the guy who's in charge of the education in the French government and his team, they made this. So it's hard to read. Um, I'm so sorry about that. I just wish uh, I had a better resolution image, but it's hard to find. But I'm just going to, Read it and translate it for you into English. So, permettre à Mihan et Alia de rire des mêmes histoires, c'est ça, la, ça la laïcité. So, allowing Mihan and Alia to laugh from the, in the, at the same stories, this is secularism, it is not, but yeah. Um, permettre à Eva et Kalija d'être inséparables tout en étant différents. So, allowing Eva and Kalija to be inseparable while being different, that's secularism. Permettre à Erin et Eden d'être égales en tout. So allowing Erin and Eden to be equal uh, in every way. Uh, and so and you can see that the kids look different, right? So there's a black girl, for example, on this one. And that would be secularism. The um, fourth one, permettre à Sasha et Nessa d'être dans le même bain, c'est ça la laïcité. So allowing Sasha and Nessa to be in the same 
uh, in the same bath. Uh, we will speak about the idiom être dans le bain as a bit of like a, a play on word here. But basically, you know, allowing them to be in the swimming pool at the same time. Sasha would be a boy and Lisa would be a girl, I guess. Uh, so that would be secularism. Permettre à math. Can't even read. Mathia, Malia. Permettre à Malia, Tidiane et Paloma de porter les mêmes couleurs. So allowing Malia, Tidiane and Paloma to wear the same colors. That would be secularism. Tout faire pour que Imran, Axel et Ismail pensent par eux-mêmes. So doing everything so that Imran, Axel and Ismail think by themselves. Secularism. Permettre à Inès, Lani, Simon and Ave, I guess. Être ensemble, uh, so allowing Ines, Lani, Simon, and Ave to be together as secularism. And donner le même enseignement à Roman, Asia, et Alex, quelle que soit leur croyance. So giving the same teaching to Roman, Asia, and Alex, no matter what your beliefs are, what their beliefs are, that's secularism. So that was a massive outcry because, as you can probably guess by now, this is extremely simplistic. And the whole point is that they have shown. Um, people, especially children, that look different and have foreign sounding names and giving the idea that secularism is treating people, like, you know, dealing with people that like dealing with diversity, basically. Dealing with diversity is secularism. Now, it is not, okay? Secularism is the principle of separating the church and the state. That's all that there is. And that is the reason why there was a massive outcry on social media. There was uh, an Instagram post that I shared last last Wednesday, I put one of them here, but she actually did it with every single one of them. And she changed the, the last word instead of laïcité. So I just put this one as an illustration. So it becomes permettre à Sacha et Nessa d'être dans le même bain, c'est ça la piscine. So allowing Sacha and Nessa in the same, to, allowing them to be in the same pool, uh, in the same bath, that is the swimming pool, right? And she did that with every, um, with every single, Zoom plus 50. Oh, thank you, Tony. So if you zoom plus 50 percent on the laptop, you allow the headline to be right. Cool. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, yeah, the, the resolution is bad, but that's good if you can zoom in. So basically, that's a very snarky thing to do. Uh, she changed it to like the second one. She made it into friendship. Uh, I don't remember. Like this one, she made it into like the, the name of the, the this piece of clothing. Um, Rire des mêmes histoires, she made the, you know, not la laïcité, but les livres, so the books. And it's, it's a really snarky thing to say. More seriously, we have a full post, uh, which I have linked here, Réaction de la Vigie de la Laïcité, it's the very last link. We have a full post by uh, these people, which is called Vigie de la Laïcité. So you realize that this is an organization. Um, I don't know if they're officially part of the government, but this is an organization whose job it is to uh, uh, police secularism in France. It's literally their, their job. And so I don't think I'm going to read it, but basically they oppose uh, this work by saying that this is a very racist thing to do, that they are connecting the foreign sounding name and the uh, you know different, ethnically different looking children to matters of religion, which it is not the same, right? Ethnicity and being a foreigner or having a foreign name does not attach you to religion. And it's, it is true that this campaign is only it's only something that educated people will snark at i i agree with them when i first saw it i was like oh my god it's it's bad it's legit bad but in their defense it's not all educated left-wing people that live in france like this gave me uh this gave me like a memories of when i was celebrating Christmas with my family back in forever when I was doing that. Because my families are these kind of people which are educated lefties and they will have a lot of, they, they will be very judgmental of these kind of things. And that makes me think of a, of, of a quote that I learned in philosophy class back when I was 18, because we have philosophy class in France in the last high school year. And that quote was, le Kantisme a les mains blanches, mais il n'a pas de mains. So that was about the philosopher Kant. Uh, but I think it's honestly the same for the left in France at this point. Like they have white hands, like you know, their hands are clean, but they don't have hands, so they can't actually do anything. I mean, if I think about it, and I thought about it a lot this week because I was preparing for the session. Yes, secularism is not what is portrayed here, but also 
how do you explain secularism knowing that a lot of people are so confused? And how do you, because I mean, la laicité is of something that everybody is going to use as an argument to say that they're right. Oh yeah, I'm right because this is la laicité. And of course, most of the time they're completely wrong. They're just being completely racist or crappy in some other way. Or just, you know, against religion, which is la laicité is not against religion. It's just that state has nothing to do with it. It's just that. So, I mean, what do you do when you're faced with a country where people are hating each other more and more? Uh, when this leads to having terror attacks because so a part of the population is feeling more and more pushed aside. And the people, of course, like, you know, like there's this all, like everybody, it's a situation where everybody's claiming to be the victim because either you're, I mean, it's mostly again, it's mostly the Muslims against other people, but it could also be other religions, but it's mostly the Muslims. Either you're not a Muslim and you perceive the other ones to be attacking you because those two terror attacks that we had recently were led by uh, extremist Muslims. So you perceive the other one to be attacking you, therefore you're a victim. Or you're a Muslim. You have nothing to do with any terror attack whatsoever. You are just here minding your own business, practicing your religion privately. Like you're supposed to do it because you're in France, but the other ones consider you to be the problem. And so you have this situation in the country, and then you are the, and of course in school, because when you have a situation in the country, it also happens in school, when you're the ministry of the minister of education and it's your job to try to make sure that kids have an okay space i don't want to say safe space because that would be a big word but an okay space to work to work in and the kids are attacking each other like that because the parents are attacking each other like that what do you do in their defense yes i agree that this perhaps a little bit awkward but also isn't it a way to dumb it down dumb it down so that people that are literally children, literal children and also people that are adults but not educated, would start to get it. That it's not so much like whether it is laicité or not, the idea like in France we also have the values of liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? It's, it's the motto of France. So liberty, equality and fraternity or freedom, equality, fraternity, brotherhood. <sighs> yes, it's not la laicité, but I think in their defense, I think maybe this campaign will actually have the desired effect and that is actually what you want. So, yeah, that was my 42 minutes long rant to try to explain what was going on, uh, what is going on in France with, with religion and what happened. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I will read a couple of comments uh, or any questions or, or feedback. The chat is here for you. All right, so John is here. Hi, John. In Catholic Church usage, laic means layperson, someone not in orders. Yes, that is actually the first point that I made in this uh, in this chat, but I, in this uh, in this tool. So at the very beginning, is the very first thing I said that laic is a person who's not in orders, not part of the Catholic Church, which is uh, still to this day officially the dominant religion in France. Some of the features of laicity began even the law of even before the laws of associations, such as under Jules Ferry, when nuns were no longer allowed to teach in municipal schools, for example. Yeah, I, I simplified it uh, as much as I could because I had to fit it, you know, closer. And to be honest, it's already longer than I uh, was expecting it to to make it. But yes, of course, it's not like one day it happened on 19, 1905. There was a long sentiment of people being against religion and wanting to get rid of. Uh, religion and that actually you can even trace it back to the French Revolution in um, nine, 1789 I mean 1789 and the years after that when so at that time people were mostly against nobility the, no, the nobles were really like the big symbol of the king and, and absolute power and the oppression of young people like young people uh, poor people you know the, the so-called third state but also it was against religion and somehow because people were religious, uh, the priests came out quite on top after the revolution, but there was still a big sentiment against them. So yes, it's, it's an ongoing situation. It's been going on for centuries. Right. Tony saying I arrived later. Yes, yes, that is, um, that is the first use case uh, of laic. It's laic is something that's not part of the church. All right, so let's look at the idioms of the week. I, I put two uh, here, and then I can do a quick French summary. I try to really summarize, not really explain everything in French. I will speak way too fast. But two idioms. Être dans le bain, so literally to be in the bath. It means to be comfortable, 
to be in a um, in a situation that you find yeah comfortable for you. So there is also se mettre dans le bain. And that would mean to get comfortable. Now, you can think of the idea of when uh, when you enter a swimming pool or a river or the sea and the temperature of the water is a bit cold. And at the beginning, you're uncomfortable. But if you stay in it, uh, you're going to get comfortable. That's this idea. So yeah, that's what it means. Être dans le bain, uh, se mettre dans le bain. Practicing Catholics weren't priests are called the laity in French. Like, yes, I think I said that at the beginning. So yeah, everybody who's not a priest is a laic as per the vision of the Catholic religion. But in France, we mostly use the word laïc uh, just to say that the religion is separate from that thing, like completely separate. So that is why you are not allowed to have a religious sign at school, even if you're not a priest yourself. And of course, the kids are not priests. The second idiom of the week is être à côté de la plaque. I thought about that because first when I, at first when I saw this campaign, I was like, okay, ils sont complètement à côté de la plaque. So être à côté de la plaque means being not understanding what's going on. Yeah, that's literally how we translate it. Like it's, you don't understand what's going on. You're completely out of your depth. Vous êtes à côté de la plaque. Right, so if you have any questions, please type them in. Otherwise, brace yourself for the French summary. I'll try to do it in 10 minutes so I can keep a couple of questions afterwards. As usual, I have links to the French Frontier Accelerator, which you can still join. You can also still apply for a scholarship, even though the next intake will be in January. So it's not very urgent now to apply, but you still can if you want to have it done or you want to take some time to write your application, you can start considering it now. Like, uh, like being clueless. Yes, that's what it means. I mean, sometimes it's too much for you to understand because you're clueless. <laughs> but no, it's more like being clueless. It's not like being overwhelmed. Right, so you ready for the French summary? Alors aujourd'hui, on a parlé de la laïcité, de la laïcité en France et de pourquoi la laïcité c'est important pour les Français. Et en fait, la laïcité c'est vraiment très compliqué et la plupart des gens ne le comprennent pas. On ne la comprennent pas plutôt. Même les Français ne la comprennent pas et il semblerait que même le gouvernement de la France ne la comprenne pas. Alors pour ça. Au départ, la définition de la laïcité, c'est le fait que quelque chose soit laïque. Et laïque, comme la vient de le rappeler John, ça veut dire, du point de vue d'un prêtre catholique, les personnes qui ne font pas partie de l'Église, qui ne sont pas des prêtres, sont des laïcs. Mais en France, le mot laïque, ça veut dire que cette chose ou cette personne n'a rien à voir avec la religion. Pas seulement les prêtres catholiques, mais les religions au total. Donc c'est pour ça qu'on a la deuxième définition qui dit qu'en France, la laïcité... C'est le principe de séparation de la société civile et de la société religieuse. C'est le fait que l'État soit séparé de la religion et que la religion n'a rien à faire avec l'État. D'ailleurs, j'aurais pu parler du mariage gay, euh, mais peut-être que j'en parlerai à la fin parce que ça va être compliqué. De, euh, si je le rajoute maintenant, ce sera un problème. Je le rajouterai à la fin, si j'oublie pas. Remind me that I tell you something about, about same-sex wedding, same-sex marriage at the end, um, because I'm just realizing, oh yeah, I should have thrown it out there in there, but I didn't. Um, and I don't want to put that in the French summary, it's just a summary. Donc, au début, après que j'ai euh, expliqué la définition de la laïcité, j'ai euh, rappelé un petit historique. Alors, comme on en a parlé, euh, on peut même retracer la, la, le combat des Français contre les religieux et pour la laïcité jusqu'à la Révolution française. Mais surtout, les choses importantes, c'était l'affaire Dreyfus, où Dreyfus a été accusé d'espionnage juste parce qu'il était juif et la plupart des gens pensaient qu'il était coupable parce qu'il était juif, alors que bien sûr, il était innocent. Et c'est ça qui a mené, en fin de compte, à la loi qui a vraiment séparé les églises et l'État en 1905. Et cette loi est toujours en vigueur. Il y a juste eu un moment où elle n'était pas en vigueur, c'était entre 1940 et 1944, euh, pendant le régime de Vichy. Et ensuite, on fait un grand bond dans l'histoire et on arrive au 7 janvier 2015, qui est la date des attentats de Charlie Hebdo, où euh, les, euh, les journalistes de Charlie Hebdo, qui étaient très connus pour leurs caricatures, et particulièrement pour avoir fait des caricatures des catholiques et du pape, beaucoup, 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 et c'était, ils ont eu énormément de procès pour toutes les caricatures qu'ils ont faites, et euh, pour être juste méchants, en fait, avec la religion, mais aussi pour quelques caricatures du prophète Mohamed. Et c'est à cause de ces quelques caricatures 
qu'il euh, y a eu les attentats de Charlie Hebdo où deux frères ont attaqué avec des armes les journalistes de Charlie Hebdo et ils ont tué presque tous les dessinateurs. Et enfin, euh, le 16 octobre 2020, donc l'année dernière, il y a eu l'assassinat de Samuel Paty. Samuel Paty, c'était un professeur d'histoire qui a été assassiné pour avoir montré ses caricatures dans sa classe d'histoire. Et ça, c'est quelque chose que la plupart, voire même presque tous, euh, presque tous les professeurs d'histoire font. C'est une partie normale de l'enseignement. Euh, la plupart des professeurs d'histoire montrent les caricatures à leurs élèves et expliquent ce qui s'est passé. Donc, tout ça, ça crée une sorte d'historique où euh, les, Français, euh, les Français aiment beaucoup la laïcité, mais ils ne savent pas vraiment ce que c'est. Il y a une grosse tension en France entre, d'un côté, les Français non musulmans et, de l'autre, les Français musulmans. Parce que, euh, ah, alors, pas tous, hein, tout le monde n'est pas complètement stupide. Mais en France, il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont tendance à se sentir menacés à cause des quelques attaques terroristes qu'il y a eu en France par des extrémistes musulmans. Et donc, ces personnes ont tendance à détester les musulmans et à les attaquer. Et de l'autre, on a les Français musulmans qui n'ont rien demandé à personne, qui faisaient juste euh, leur vie normalement et qui pratiquaient leur religion de manière privée, comme ils sont censés le faire, parce que la laïcité le leur permet, qui donc se sentent attaqués parce que les autres euh, les attaquent et euh, les détestent à cause de ça. Et ça, c'est le climat dans lequel on se retrouve à avoir cette campagne qui a été très euh, critiquée sur les réseaux sociaux cette semaine. Donc, cette campagne a été révélée mercredi, ce mercredi. Et on peut voir euh, des enfants qui ont des origines ethniques différentes et aussi des prénoms étrangers. Donc, vous pouvez voir que Mian et Alia, ce pas des prénoms français. Euh, Erin et Eden, ce pas vraiment des prénoms français. Nessa, ce pas un prénom français. Et les enfants euh, ont euh, des... Euh, des, euh, des visages différents et sont une certaine diversité ethnique. Et il y a eu beaucoup de critiques sur Twitter, sur Instagram et même une réaction de la vigie de la laïcité. Oui, parce qu'en France, il y a même un organisme dont c'est le travail de surveiller la laïcité. Et cet organisme a accusé très... Euh, cet organisme a critiqué très violemment le gouvernement en disant que la nouvelle campagne est raciste et xénophobe et que euh, ça n'a rien à voir avec la laïcité, ce qui est vrai. Et par exemple, je vous ai mis un petit post ici qui, euh, qui vient de, du compte Instagram Outragé, que vous pouvez suivre, où euh, c'est un influenceuse, influenceur, influenceuse, je ne sais pas, euh, c'est cette influenceuse qui a euh, refait les images pour, euh, pour critiquer le gouvernement. Parce que les Français aiment beaucoup critiquer le gouvernement. Et c'est surtout des personnes de gauche assez éduquées qui ont fait ces critiques. Et je suis d'accord avec les critiques. Mais d'un autre côté, il faut bien se rendre compte que le gouvernement français, il fait ce qu'il peut. Euh, on a une situation où il y a énormément de tensions dans le pays, et particulièrement dans les écoles, parce que tous les problèmes qu'on a dans un pays, on se retrouve à les avoir dans les écoles. Et les écoles, c'est l'endroit où la laïcité est le plus important. Dans les écoles en France, on n'a pas le droit de montrer des signes de religion, en tout cas pas des signes très visibles. Et ça, ça pose des problèmes parce que, par exemple, on considère parfois que le, le voile, le voile islamique, euh, islamique, euh, c'est un signe de religion, alors que très souvent, ce n'est pas un signe de religion, c'est un signe culturel. Mais en tout cas, on essaie d'empêcher euh, les élèves, euh, les filles, de porter des voiles parce qu'on considère que ça va contre la laïcité. Et donc, on a cette situation euh, très tendue et je pense que ce n'est pas forcément une mauvaise idée euh, pour le gouvernement d'avoir créé cette campagne où, en fait, il simplifie l'idée de, de laïcité. C'est vrai que c'est sur-simplifié, trop simplifié et un petit peu exagéré, mais on s'adresse quand même à des enfants. Donc, on essaye de montrer la laïcité sous un bon jour et d'une manière que les enfants peuvent comprendre. Et ça, c'est quand même assez difficile dans la mesure où tout le monde, tout le monde, tout le monde en France dit « Oui, la laïcité, c'est important », alors qu'en fait, eux-mêmes, ils ne savent pas ce que ça veut dire. Donc voilà, je pense qu'on peut défendre le gouvernement et que finalement, sa campagne, elle n'est pas si mal. On avait aussi les idiomes de la semaine, les expressions de la semaine qui étaient « être dans le bain ».« Être dans le bain », ça veut dire être confortable, être à l'aise. Et le deuxième, c'était « être à côté de la plaque ». C'est le contraire, « être à côté de la plaque », ça veut dire qu'on ne comprend pas ce qui se passe et qu'on n'arrive pas à s'en sortir. Et pour certaines personnes, on peut dire que la, le, la campagne du gouvernement est à côté de la plaque, alors que peut-être si on prend un, du recul... Maintenant, après y avoir pensé beaucoup, je pense que c'est effectivement ces personnes, euh, les personnes de gauche qui sont très éduquées mais qui ne savent pas quoi faire pour régler le problème, je pense que c'est vraiment elles qui sont à côté de la plaque et que finalement, ben, 
le gouvernement a pas forcément, c'est pas forcément une mauvaise idée. Et particulièrement en rapport avec les réactions d'Emmanuel Macron euh, quand il y a eu les attaques terroristes, qui était très, euh, il a été très euh, ferme. Il n'a pas du tout euh, cherché à appeler à l'unité nationale. Je pense que c'était un problème et que peut-être euh, avec ça, le gouvernement peut commencer à régler le problème. Oui. I know it was really fast. I tried to pack everything in the French summary. I hope you understood most of what I said. We still have five minutes, so if you have any questions, please, uh, please ask them. And I'll, I'll read through the comments here. So Tony is saying, I suppose all controversial advertising gets more attention. Tolerance instead of laicity would be ignored by some. Yes, I, I agree. And it might have been made controversial on purpose so that people would post it on social media and speak about it. That could be a possibility. Like maybe the, the communication people of the government have thought, oh yeah, like if we make a government Uh, if, it, if they had made a campaign that wasn't controversial, I wouldn't even have known about it because I'm not in France. I would just wouldn't have even seen it. And if I had seen it, um, probably, a, you know, because I would have been on a trip or something. Yeah, I would have ignored it. So yes, I think it's a great job. And also, tolerance is not a French value. Laïcité is. And people who are crying about laïcité are not crying about tolerance. It's like, I guess they take it for granted that they're tolerant, but they're really not. So yeah. Also, education seems to be about making lots of sweeping generalization and being overly descriptive. Yes, this is true. This is now may mean without looking, without thought being offensive, hopefully accidentally. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't think it's offensive. I, I do agree on an intellectual level. I mean, um, you have the link to this. I'm not going to read it because it's complex French. You might just not really understand it if I read it, but the link is in the, in the worksheet. You can follow it. Um, I, I, I agree with that criticism on an intellectual level. I don't, however, agree that the campaign is offensive per se. I don't think anyone uh, would be, of, like anyone of the so-called targeted group, because I mean, you're realizing that it's white people accusing other white people of being racist, right? Like this, I mean, I don't actually know who wrote this uh, and maybe they're not white, but in all cases, it's educated people accusing other educated people of being racist. I don't know that anyone is really being offended at all, except for maybe a uh, regime de la laïcité by those images, because they're really images that are calling for tolerance. Yes, it's dumbed down. Yes, it's a bit ridiculous from the point of view of someone with a lot of education, which, you know, I'm definitely part of that group. But not everybody in France has this level of education and this level of awareness of history and of how, how things are supposed to work. And the main issue is that people actually don't understand what laïcité is and you have to dumb it down for them, hoping that they will get it and that they start being tolerant. And it's really, it's not about secularism, it's about tolerance, you're right. And you said you understood most of the summary in French. Cool, I'm, I'm glad, that's, that's really cool. All right, um, happy to be here. We have another two minutes left. So if you have a questions, uh, please ask away. The chat is here for that. I see we still have 10 people live, so that's amazing. Uh, anyone uh, who's willing to ask a question, uh, yeah. If you're still here, please click the like button. It always helps to know that people have liked the, uh, the video. And yes, you can still join the French French Accelerator. You have the links in there. The, I need to update the, the page. The page has not been updated since last uh, week. I will do that as soon as possible. Um, for me, I found it was more, more impor important to be making this live and to be making some videos, some recorded videos, and to be live with the French Accelerator students now three hours ago. Uh, you know, I, I think those were more important than just updating my website, but I will do it as soon as possible so that uh, the, uh, the information there is actually uh, relevant and correct. And tomorrow you're getting a new French with Bradley Cooper video. Oh, please tell me, by the way, if you have watched them and if you have found them helpful. Um, I, I would love to have some feedback. Uh, I've tried to make the new one more helpful, like even more helpful than the first one um, by, by short, shortening the, the introduction and by adding more uh, writing. Also, it's 48 minutes, so it's really, really long. But um, yeah, I will be there tomorrow. And yes, so this month I will make another of these lives about learning French and Spanish and another one about making French gender neutral. And I was thinking of something else but I forgot. So if you have a topic that you would like me to speak about, please just pop it right now or, you know, comment it somewhere or email me and uh, I will, uh, I will make those topics. I don't remember what I wanted to do. That's pretty bad. 
I'll, I'll find it again. But yeah, like the next two are going to be French and Spanish and, um, and uh, making French, well, making French, speaking in a gender neutral fashion in French. All right, we are arriving right at the 60 minutes mark. Uh, I see that nobody is commenting anymore, so I'm going to sign off. Thank you guys so much for being here with me. It was amazing to have you. I'm really impressed that we had actually so many people and so much reaction for this topic. Uh, because I was scared that it would be something dry that most people would not be interested in, but I was wrong. So this encourages me to make more uh, content. Actually, tell me if you want to have more about French culture and things like French value. I could make one about universalism if you want, although it's something I'm going to be much more critical of than laicite, because laicite is something I stand behind, but universalism, I'm like, after I've lived abroad, I'm like, okay, this is, this is dumb. Um, you know, live abroad and become a citizen of the world and become ed educated, but I could do that, yes. Okay, so Tony is saying the videos are helpful, also describe mistakes. Yes, yes, that's what I'm doing in the next ones. I, I mean, all eight are recorded. So I'm just going uh, to just have to, uh, you know, edit them. And that includes a lot of like adding little bits of text. So yeah, more about the presentation of the topic than the topic itself, which is why it was good. Um, I'm not sure what you mean with that. You mean that I presented, oh, like, I explained the basics as opposed to just discussing nicety, I guess, referring to this topic. Okay, yeah. I really wanted to make it something quite basic that people would be able to understand. I mean, you, <laughs> everybody ideally who speaks English can understand what I shared today about laicity. And to be honest, it's such a confusing topic. I actually looked if there were uh, videos about laicity on YouTube and there were a few. I actually didn't watch them because I didn't want to get influenced. So I don't know what's in there, but there was there weren't that many. So I'm hoping that having this like full one hour discussion of it is going to be helpful for people and that they'll be able to find it uh, also in the future. So anyway, we are past the one hour mark. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you guys so much. I will see you next Sunday. I will see those of you who are in the French Accelerator next Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And I will see you everyone here at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern on Sunday and you will have a new podcast and probably more than one new videos this week. I'm, uh, I'm preparing that. All right. Thank you guys. See you next week.